Now this tendency to be a wee bit economical with the truth, combined with an almost uncanny understanding of the law, helped the Campbells to see the land-grabbing opportunities in all kinds of legal contract, but especially in the most important of all, the marriage certificate, even if the bride-to-be was only four years of age. My journey now takes me to the northeast of Scotland, to Cawdor Castle, just outside Inverness, which has been part of the Campbell dynasty for the last 500 years. But Cawdor only passed into Campbell hands after the Earl of Argyll abducted Muriel, the four-year-old heiress to this castle, in the 1490s. I asked Lady Campbell, the current Dowager Countess of Cawdor, to explain the background to what, on the face of it, seems like a cruel and opportunistic case of child kidnapping. What happened was the eighth Thane of Corda was killed. He had a posthumous daughter. That means that she was born after his death. She was obviously at birth an heiress. And already in those days, the Campbells were the strong arm of the king. And so the old Argyle said to the king, I'd like this heiress for my son. King James IV, the little girl's guardian, was happy to see Muriel promised in marriage to the Campbells. But instead of fixing a wedding day, the Campbells kidnapped the little girl, fearing that Muriel's uncles would kill her to stop the castle and its lands passing into Campbell hands. They wanted to keep Muriel alive. But of course, you know, the kidnapping was a horrible thing to do to a little child. And um, the whole sort of sequence of events is absolutely awful. So I would say another one of those typical Campbell strong-arm tactics, they wanted the inheritance, so it was in their interest that the little girl stay alive. So anything, it seems, including child abduction, could be justified if your number one priority was building and keeping a clan empire. Throughout the 15th and 16th centuries, the Campbells used holy wedlock, the law, and support from their old friends, the Stuart Kings, to expand their territories from Ayrshire in the south through Argyll and north into Murray. With so much land, Clan Campbell was now a clan with clout and a stalwart of the old Catholic establishment. But with the 1550s came revolutionary change. The cosy old relationship between the Campbells and the Stuart monarchy, which for so long had boosted the fortunes of the clan, was about to suffer a catastrophic reverse after the Protestant Reformation swept Scotland. The radical preacher, John Knox, was the figurehead of this religious revolution. He personally converted the Campbells to his radical brand of Protestantism, an act that would ultimately place the clan at loggerheads with the monarchy. This takes us back to where I began my journey into the story of Clan Campbell, the conflict of faith between King Charles I and Archibald Campbell, Marquess of Argyll. Professor Ted Cowan has studied the troubled relationship between this Campbell chief and the king. I suppose of all the Campbells, Archibald the first Marquess of Argyll, lying over there in his tomb, kind of embodies all the tensions that existed at the time between religion and the monarchy. Now, Archibald actually went against the king. Why, why would he do that? Well, the issue was that there was a fear that Charles I, the king of the day, was trying to anglicise the Scottish church. They didn't like that because they thought this meant a return to Rome. Many people had suffered through the Reformation over three generations by now to bring about, the, as they thought, perfect religion in Scotland, and that was jeopardised by the actions of Charles I. What did Archibald I Marquis do? Well, he organises committees, he sits on committees, he sits in Parliament. Nobody moves a muscle without a girl say so in this particular period. He is the Viceroy, if you want to call him that. Some people thought he was the dictator of Scotland. Not only is he the chief of the most powerful clan in all of the Highlands and indeed of all of, in all of Highland history, but he's also now the, the numero uno in Scotland. And he's probably the most significant single figure of the 17th century in this country. To what extent was he motivated by principle? Well, this is a guy who used to get up at five o'clock in the morning to say his prayers, went everywhere with a Bible. He sometimes delivered the sermon at Inverary Kirk if the minister didn't turn up. This man was devoutly, devoutly religious, but he was also a hard-headed 
pragmatist, a politician, and he saw it as his duty in the absence of the king to show himself to the people as he wished the king to be portrayed to the people. So in a sense, he stood in for the king. And this is, a, this is amazing at this point in time. It's a revolutionary situation. This is a constitutional upheaval just as much as it is a religious one. Charles I was outraged at this Scottish revolt. In 1640, he mobilised his royalist supporters, triggering a civil war. The king's army in Scotland was led by the brilliant general, the Marquis of Montrose. Montrose rallied sympathetic Highland clans to the royal standard, many of them traditional enemies of the Campbells. Meanwhile, Argyll rallied his Campbell troops to protect the country's western seaboard, now threatened by the king's Catholic supporters in Ireland. The Civil War not only split Scotland along sectarian lines, but provided the perfect opportunity for rival clans like the Macdonalds and Campbells to pursue ancient feuds. Now, this might explain the enthusiasm behind the Campbells' attack on Rathlin Island, a Macdonald stronghold just an hour's sail from the coast of Argyll. The result was a massacre. Having killed all the men in battle, the Campbells hurled the surviving women and children from the cliffs into the sea. More than 300 Macdonalds died. A year would pass before the Macdonalds could avenge the deaths of their kinsfolk. The opportunity came in 1644 when they invaded Scotland, joining forces with Montrose and the Royalist army. In December that year, they attacked Inverary, desperate to shed Campbell blood. The Macdonald's commander at Inverary was Alastair McCullough. Ruthless, battle-hardened, he had a personal grudge against the Campbells, who'd imprisoned his elderly father. And ever since McCullough had landed on the coast of Argyll with a band of Macdonalds from Northern Ireland, he'd lain waste to vast areas of Scotland as part of the Royalist army, burning, pillaging and killing Campbells wherever he could find them. And it was not for nothing that he was known as the Devastator. Devastated by name and deed, McCullough unleashed the wrath and bloodlust of his Macdonald army on the sleeping Campbells. This was the massacre that forced the Marquis of Argyll to flee his castle in a rowing boat. But within weeks, Argyll had mustered his Campbell army to hunt down the Macdonalds, who were marching northwards with the Royalist General Montrose. What happened next was one of the most decisive military encounters of the entire civil war in Scotland. In a brilliant, preemptive move, McCullough ordered his army to about turn. Crossing the mountains in the depths of winter, they surprised the Campbells before dawn at Inverlochy, just outside present-day Fort William. Military historian John McFarlane takes up the story. So the Campbells standing here would have realised pretty quickly that they were at a serious disadvantage to have been surprised like this. Yes, as soon as they heard the trumpets and saw the, the banners being unfurled over there, they realised that the Macdonald, the whole Macdonald army was, was actually facing them there. And of course, that was the time when the Macdonalds chose to attack immediately. The two flanks of the Campbell army collapsed leaving the centre exposed. The centre then retreated. There was nowhere to go because there was a great slope behind them there and a rout took place. They reckon that there was about 1,200 Campbells killed out of 3,000. But how many, how, many, how many McDonald's lost their lives here in comparison? Very few. They, it's difficult to get exact figures, but they reckon that there were 200 wounded. Contemporary sources say 200 wounded and about 20 killed. But 20 McDonald's compared to 1,200 Campbells? Yes, you're talking about the officer class of the, 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 the clan were decimated at that point. And you can safely say that the loss of life among Campbells in this area was not matched again until the slaughter of the, the First World War. 